The best epigenetic clock for predicting chronological age is the Horvath clock, and that's what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got DNA M age, or DNA methylation age, otherwise known as epigenetic age, plotted against chronological age on the X, and this is from birth through 100 years old. But note that there are a lot of different colored circles on this plot. This is a multi-cell and tissue clock, so many different cell types and tissue types were used to derive these, uh, this correlation. In terms of that correlation, it's almost perfectly linear with a correlation coefficient of 0.94. Note that in this case, a positive correlation, a perfectly linear correlation would be a correlation coefficient of 1.0. So Horvath's correlation with chronological age of 0.94 is as close to as good as it can get for its correlation with chronological age. And in terms of statistical significance, you can see next to that is the p-value at 1 times 10 to the negative 200, far below the statistical significance threshold of less than 0.05. Now, a major focus of the channel is to optimize biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible, and biological age metrics are obviously included in, on that list, including Horvath. So with that in mind, what's my data? As I now have 16 tests, which is what we'll see here. So when I first started testing in 2022, average Horvath age was 55 years, which when compared with my chronological age was six years older, not six years younger, like, or, or more like pheno age, but older, six years older than my chronological age of 49 years. So it should be pretty clear, at least based on those first three tests, that Horvath's epigenetic age is a weak spot. And that has relatively continued over the past two years or so. Now, three tests, though, over a one-year period, 2022, may not be enough for a full-year average. So to see if 55 was representative of my full-year average, I then tested more often in 2023, testing eight times. And there, we could see that my Horvath epigenetic age was 52.8 years, a bit better, and moving in the right direction, as it's only three years older than my chronological at that time. Still, it's, it's not great. It's in the wrong direction. And in terms of how does this, how do, how do I rationalize this with phenoage being 17 years or so younger for every test, I'll describe that in the testing, in a testing hierarchy video coming sometime soon. All right, so what about in 2024? I currently have five tests, which is what we can see there, and the average Horvath epigenetic age is 53.3 years, about the same as where it was in 2022, but now only two years older than my chronological. So there has been some progress in keeping Horvath's uh, epigenetic age from you know going crazy, not, not too far away from my chronological age. But I should mention there is reason for optimism, and that's because of my last test, and if you saw the, the, the title of the video, it was my best data yet. So for the July test, July 26th, that's the most recent test, uh, that was 45.7 for Horvath, and that's by far my best data ever. And note that uh, just like telomere length and many other biomarkers, Horvath's epigenetic age increases with chronological age. So that I could reduce it to six years, around six years younger than my chronological uh, after 16 tests, to me seems like an unlikely event. Now, that said, there are some caveats. And the first is, why wasn't my, why isn't my current 2024 average of 53.3 years, why isn't that lower when I had a 45.7 year, right? So for the two previous tests, it was 58. So at this point in the video, I could proclaim I've reduced my epigenetic age by 12 years. Technically, that's true. But if we look at the full year averages, not so much. And then it also raises a couple of questions. Is there just a lot of variability in this test? I mean, a 12-year swing is a wide range. I don't see that anywhere near that wide of a range for phenoage, for example, or other biomarkers. So it's possible that this test has a lot of variability inherent in its test-to-test -test measurement. So that's one caveat. The other is that I might have done something to discover the recipe to finally keep it lower than my chronological age. So with that in mind, what's the recipe or what might be the recipe for a relatively youthful Horvath epigenetic age? So to start with that story, let's take a look at correlations following test number 15. This is after the May test, not the July test. So after every test, I calculate correlations with diet and supplements, fitness metrics, sleep, everything you can think of, which is what we'll see here. So to the right, we've got the p-value as the measure of statistical significance. And note that each of these nine foods or nutrients on the list has a p-value less than 0.05. And this is the partial list. The full list is on the correlations tier on Patreon. So if you're interested in that, check it out.
In terms of the correlation, we've got the lowercase r, that's the correlation coefficient. And then in terms of what's on the list, protein and total fat, just to start, relatively higher levels of protein and total fat are significantly or were significantly correlated with an older Horvath's epigenetic age. So that suggests that if I reduce my intake or when my intake for protein and total fat were towards the lower end of my intake range over the first five, uh, 15 tests, that I had a, a relatively younger Horvath epigenetic age. All right, so for total fat, that doesn't tell us if it's omega-3, omega-6, sat fat, monounsaturated, et cetera. But as we can see on the list, saturated fatty acids were, on, uh, were significantly and positively correlated with Horvath's epigenetic age. But that too doesn't say, what is it coming from? Is it from meat? Is it from plants? The majority of my sat fat comes from coconut butter. And that too is on the list and a positive correlation. So it looks like total fat, sat fat, and coconut butter may have a part in this story. Also on the list, alfalfa sprouts, peanuts, and trigonelline, relatively higher intakes of those foods or nutrients were significantly correlated with an older epigenetic age. In contrast, cloves and cinnamon were inversely correlated. So that suggests that when cloves and cinnamon were towards the higher end of my intake range over the first 15 tests, I, that was correlated with a younger Horvath epigenetic age. All right, so what do I do with this information? I have a list of correlations. What do I do? How do I actually put the data into practice? So for the positive correlations, in this case, I would reduce intake or keep them towards the lower end of the range. So what does that look like? So the total fat average prior to test 15 was 93 grams per day, and that's not an approximation. I weigh all my food using a food scale. So for the 59-day period from the test in May to the test in July, I averaged 10 grams of fat less per day to 83 grams per day. So that follows the correlation because the correlation suggests that if I lower my fat intake, that I could make a dent on Horvath's epigenetic age. And again, these are correlations. The only way I can test causation is by following the correlations. And not just one, trying to follow as many of the correlations atop the list as possible. Similarly, I cut sat fat. And from 22, 22 grams per day prior to test number 15 to 14 grams per day for the 59-day period that corresponded to test number 16. And sat fat, that cut came almost exclusively from coconut butter, as I cut it from an average of 18 grams per day prior to test 15 to an average of only 2 grams per day prior to test number 16. So the sat fat and the coconut butter uh, correlations, I'm following the correlations because that data suggests that I should go lower, and that's what I did prior to test number 16. So what about the inverse correlations? How do I follow that? So inverse correlations suggest that I should increase intake in this case, or keep it relatively high. So for cloves, which were zero grams per day, I didn't eat it at all prior to test number 15, I increased it towards the higher end of my range, which isn't that much, 0.4 grams per day. So I'm not actually measuring out 400 milligrams per day. That's a couple of grams, a couple of times per week. And then similarly, so that follows the correlation. Similarly, cinnamon was zero grams per day prior to test number 15. I increased that to half a gram per day. Again, two grams a couple of times per week. And that too would be following the correlation as I increased it above where it was relative to the prior test. But note that I didn't follow all of the correlations on this list. And one of them is protein. So the positive correlation for protein of 0.76 suggested that I should go lower for protein intake if that could make a dent with causation on Horvath's epigenetic age. But I increased it from 105 grams per day before test number 15 to 112 grams per day for the 59-day period from the May test to the July test. So that did not follow the correlation. Nonetheless, without going through everything else on the list, I followed seven of the nine correlations following test number 15. So then, if a food or nutrient is causatively involved in Horvath's epigenetic age or with any biomarker, I use this same strategy for every biomarker, its correlation over time will strengthen. If not, it will weaken. So how did these correlations change following the July test? So I recalculate correlations after every test. How does the data look? And that's what we'll see here now. So 16 test correlations, Horvath's epigenetic age versus diet. Same setup. On the right, we've got the p-value, and note that all of the nine foods, foods or nutrients on this list have the p-value less than 0.05. In fact, it's less than 0.03. Full list, again, on Patreon, if you're interested in the correlations, not just for this, for, but for all the biomarkers. I look at all biomarker correlations with diet and other metrics. So if you're interested in that, check it out. So then remember our premise. 
If a food or nutrient is causally involved with Horvath's epigenetic age or any biomarker, its correlation will strengthen over time. If not, it will weaken. So what got stronger and what got weaker? So first we can see that sat fats correlation increased, got stronger to 0.78, and that's up from 0.62. Similarly, coconut butter's correlation also strengthened, 0.75 up from 0.54. And soda cloves, up, well, actually, more, it's more negative. In, in the negative correlations, if it gets closer to negative 1, that's getting stronger. So cloves went from negative uh, 0.62 to negative 0.7 following test number 16. So that those three correlations strengthened would add support to the hypothesis that they may be involved in mechanisms that impact my Horvath's epigenetic age. Now, I can't say if that would be true for others, but I would recommend using a similar approach of tracking diet and supplements and other, other variables in conjunction with blood testing and then looking at correlations in your own data to see what the recipe is for you, right? It, it, it may be the same as mine, but it might be different too. All right, so also note that total fat, though, its correlation weakened. So it went from 0.73 following test number 15 to 0.55 following test number 16. So that suggests it's not a total fat story or it might not be a total fat story in terms of Horvath's epigenetic age. It might be more specifically targeted to sat fat and sat fat coming from coconut butter. But note that many of the correlations following test number 15 weaken. So protein, uh, peanuts, cinnamon, and trigonelline, they are no longer in the top nine as we can see on the far right, on the right, following the correlations after test number 16. But now we've got a new medium, you know, a middle list of correlations to follow. So am I following those correlations for test number 17? And I should say, before going into that, with the goal of repeating or potentially trying to repeat the 45.7 result, I've purposely kept sat fat, specifically from coconut butter, low, so two grams per day. I've purposely kept Cloves, relatively high, I've actually increased it by a little bit, 0.4 to 0.5 grams. Whether that makes a dent, a tenth, you know, 100 milligrams makes a dent on Horvath, I don't know, but we'll see. And total fat is, again, a bit lower at 81 grams per day relative to the 83 following test number 16. All right, so what about the other ones that now popped up on the list? Am I following those correlations? Because the goal is to follow as many as possible because I can't presume that it's only two or three or four nutrients or foods that can impact the given biomarker. I try to follow them all. So starting from the top, uh, sardines actually were at my highest intake ever following test number 15. So I cut back on that because blood urea nitrogen and uric acid went in the wrong direction. But when considering the Horvath data, I may go higher, especially if I don't see 45.7 for Horvath again. Maybe I'll see if I see 48, that would suggest that maybe sardines have a role in that uh, recipe. So with that in mind, I will increase sardines following the next test. I'm currently following correlations for copper and B5. Those are positive correlations, which, which suggests that I should reduce my intake by a bit relative to the last test. So I've reduced intake relative to the last test. So that follows the correlation. Similarly, for manganese, that's an inverse correlation. So I should go a little bit higher relative to the last test. I've done that, but I have not increased vitamin E as high as it was for the last test. Vitamin E was in part high because I had a high intake of broccoli sprouts and broccoli. And uh, I, this is a story for another day, but that may have increased my nighttime respiratory rate and reduced my heart rate variability and increased my resting heart rate. I already posted that story on Patreon, but that's a story for another day. Nonetheless, not following the vitamin E correlation, it's a bit, a little bit lower than it was uh, prior to this test. Nonetheless, though, I followed seven of the nine correlations for both following test 15 and test 16. Will it work? I just took that test two days ago. Those results take about three weeks to a month to come in. So expect an update video for Horvath's epigenetic age coming sometime in mid to late October. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where you can see those biomarker correlations, but I also provide blood, blood, blood test consults for those who are trying to optimize their own biomarkers towards youth and health. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate, affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while also helping to support the channel including epigenetic testing, Ulta Labs, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, including the CBC and standard chem panel, at-home metabolomics, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home blood testing with Cyflox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. 
Have a great day.